Number two, let's make sure that as much as possible when we argue, we look for overlapping values that the different moral frameworks have. There are overlapping values. And as much as possible, argue to, to a person from a different moral framework within their framework. So for example, Charles Taylor, uh, the philosopher, wrote an article some years ago called An Unforced Consensus on Human Rights. And he says, if you're going to Thailand and you're trying to make a case that you need to be stronger on human rights, you don't say, why don't you become secular like us? He says, you go into Buddhism and say, are there resources inside the Buddhist moral framework for human rights? He, th he thinks there are. Instead of just saying, well, when you, when you Easterners become you know, secular and, and enlightened like us Westerners, which, by the way, is an incredible imperialism, he says, uh, if you do that, of course, all their people are going to do is put up walls. Instead, when you argue, look for overlapping consensus and look, if you're going to argue, argue within their moral framework. Say, I know what your framework is, and so why don't you see this? Number three, then take a vote. Number one, open to everybody. Number two, look for overlapping consensus and try as much as possible to work uh, inside people's moral frameworks. Then number three, argue and argue and then take a vote, and it's democracy. Whoever has the most votes wins, and that's the legislation. And the norms, the moral norms, who get the most votes, those are the norms are going to be enshrined in our law. But then number four, really, really, really respect minorities. My father uh, was a conscientious objector in World War II. He was a pacifist. He had only one friend that he maintained from before World War II, and he kept after World War II. Uh, lost all of his friends. And yet, you know, um, he was a conscious objector. You know, uh, World War II, uh, you had a fight in order to defend our freedom. It was a law that if you were a male of a certain age, you had to be subject to the draft, it was a law. But uh, America has always said, if your religious conscience doesn't allow you to do that, then we're not going to force you. And that's, I just, I hope we don't go away from that. And I do think there's a very good possibility there is. So here's the four things, and I'm done. Oh, one last thing. I'm sorry. There's five. The one thing was open to everybody. The second thing is to argue the way I was saying. The third thing is take a vote. The fourth thing is respect my Here's the last thing. Uh, John Haidt, in his book, talks about the righteous mind. That in his Righteous Mind book, he talks about the righteous mind. At one point, he actually says he believes that human beings are programmed not just to be righteous, but to be self-righteous. There is no doubt in my mind that that is the main problem, the reason why we haven't had a pluralistic society. It's not just that people believe that they're right. Everybody believes that they're right. Everybody. If you're an atheist, if you're an agnostic, uh, if, you're, if you're a Christian, if you're a Muslim, you believe you're right. Your take on spiritual reality is right. The real question is, how self-righteous are you? How, uh, how condescending are you? How disdainful are you? That's the question. All I can tell you, those who are here who are Christians, you've got something in the very middle of your Christian faith which ought to destroy self-righteousness and make you, at the very least, agents of pluralism and civility. It's the idea that you are saved by grace alone, not by your good works. I've got a Muslim family on my floor, a Hindu family on my floor, an atheist a couple on my floor. And because I'm a Christian, I know that I'm not saved. I'm not a Christian. I don't have a relationship with God because I'm better, but because of God's grace, because Jesus Christ died for me and I believe in him. It's not because I'm a better person or a smarter person or a more moral person. So when I talk to my Hindu or my Muslim or my atheist neighbors, I have every reason to expect they could be better people than me. I have every reason to believe that their husbands could be better husbands than me. Every reason to believe that. I have every reason to believe they may be better people than me. Why? Because my understanding of how Christianity works, how salvation works, is that I have no basis for that kind of superiority. So there really actually is something in the very center of Christianity that ought to make you, make us, those who are Christians, someone who really can be part of making for a pluralistic society. After 9-11, excuse me, after 9-11, uh, two days after 9-11, we were reading all these articles in the paper about how this is what religious fundamentalism brings violence. And my wife, Kathy, was hearing me read one of those editorials out loud, and she says, no, not necessarily. 
She says, religious fundamentalism doesn't necessarily lead to violence. Uh, she said, it depends on what your fundamental is. Have you ever seen a, an Amish terrorist? And what she means is, if the very center of your faith is a man dying for his enemies, a man who wouldn't strike back, a man who's saying, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing, uh, yeah, you, you know, Christians have been agents of oppression, but in spite of, not because of, what's at the heart of their faith. So John Hyde, I'm sure, has his own approach to how do you deal with the self-righteousness? That's the Christian approach, and it's a powerful one. Thank you.